DDP Snake Pit fans, what is going on? It's time for another edition of The Snake Pit right here exclusively on Podcast Heat and AdFreeShows.com. I'm John Alba. This week, it's just a solo shot. He's begrudgingly sitting down beside me here. Mr. Jake the Snake Roberts. Jake, what's going on, man? How are you? Well, I told you earlier, and I'm not going to lie to the fans out there, I was doing good when I saw your face. Yeah, yeah, and, that's, uh, that's, that's you know, generally the What's sentiment. the deal? What's the deal with wearing the hat backwards, man? I mean, I, uh, what's up with that? So the what does it's, that actually, mean? it's actually for compatibility with my headphones. It's easier oh, to wear yeah, the yeah. headphones over it backwards versus in front of it. Uh, also, uh, I have a really tiny head, a really tiny head. Really? So, so very tiny. <laughs> I heard it was tiny, but never mind. That's why I love you, Jake the Snake Roberts. I'm excited to chat with you here today because we are discussing one of the most iconic names in professional wrestling, quite frankly. And that, of course, is... Oh. We will be talking about you, but also the dead man, the Undertaker. And uh, this is a guy that has transcended generations of wrestling fans. You've had your own run-ins with him. And I feel like he's kind of on that Mount Rushmore of iconic figures in professional wrestling. So this should be a good one. When I say, when I say the undertaker, what Mm -hmm. comes to mind? Strip joint, Indianapolis. Um, We were driving like hell to get there and, you know, had to make last call. It was just something you had to do. And as we're getting closer, I, he says, man, he says, you're really pumped to go. I said, man, I, I know this girl there, you know, and uh, she's quite the performer, you know. And he says, what do you mean? I said, well, she doesn't like guys. And he goes, oh, my God, you're kidding me. I said, no. He goes, that's so weird because I got the chick that doesn't like him either. And she's in Indianapolis. Oh, my no God. <laughs> so we drove like hell, man. We drove like hell to get there. We're driving 100 miles an hour because we got all these thoughts going through our heads. You know, sh- shame on you, Jake. And uh, we get there and we go in, man. We made it. It's like 20 minutes before last call. We're looking around. And I went, oh, man, there's my girl. And he goes, oh, really? Okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. There's my girl. I'm like, great, man. Get her. And all of a sudden, we're both standing in front of the same girl. That's, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What year would that have been in around? That was when he first came into the WWF. Okay. You know, at the time. You know, he, he first came to me when he first got there. And he says, uh. Jake, I'll be riding with you. I'm like, well, that's kind of bold. You're going to set up rides for me now? No, I want to travel with you. I'm like, okay. So you want to get underneath the learning tree. I mean, I appreciate you you being bold enough to come up and ask me straight out. Hey, man, I'll be glad to share anything I know. He goes, well, that's great too, but I heard you know where all the good strip joints are. I feel I like said, that might be a side of The Undertaker we haven't heard too much about. I said, worldwide. Worldwide. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, I'm going to hang with you. I said, dude, let's be honest. You played basketball, didn't you? He said, yeah. I said, you'd probably be better off going and dribbling somewhere in a corner than trying to hang with me because I'll bury your dumb ass. You can't hang with me. It's a challenge. I'll meet you one for one. Okay, let's go. So we did that for about two months. But it was taking a heavy toll on him. And Mm -hmm. uh, I remember going to TV one night and Vince is a dead man. You you don't need to put the paint on tonight. You're You're looking dead enough already. You, you need to get the hell away from Jake. <laughs> and uh, a week or two later, he, 
somebody told me, I don't know if it's true or not. Well, I do know that it's true, but he got alcohol poisoning. Oh, wow. And, and uh, that's when I, 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 I ended the contest and said, look, man, I cheat. There's no way in the hell I'm going to lose to you. Because I know there's vitamins that you can take that will keep you going no matter how much you drink. And I shared the information with him, which wasn't a good thing to do because it was something that was highly addictive, <laughs> you know, and uh, that was my bad road. But uh, no, Mark traveled with me, man, and uh, some good times, man, some, some of my favorite times. And uh, him and... Uh, Oh my God! Ooh, just a second, Percy Pringle. Yeah, he was such, he was such a sweet guy. You know, uh, Percy was too much, man, and <clears throat> he got Mark's character down, and he knew exactly what to do, and he he was there for Mark all the way through. Let me ask you that: Was Percy Paul Bearer? Of course, we're talking about here. Was he instrumental to making sure that people bought The Undertaker as a serious character? Because I feel like without oh, yeah. Percy, I'm not sure The Undertaker has legs in those early years there. Right, right. You're exactly right. He made sure that he was an evil bastard. I mean, you can't look at Percy and say anything but evil. I'll tell you a funny one about him, though. You ready for this? Let's hear it. At the time we were booked in upstate New York, you know, in upstate New York, they have those places that are, you know, they're honeymoon, honeymoon suites and all the real nice stuff, you know, for people that are wanting to take a little vacation, they go up in the mountains and casinos and whatever, you know, and they have all these honeymoon suites, you know, honeymoon hotels and stuff. And we went up there and did a show and we were staying in a hotel that had all these honeymoon suites. And they gave them all the guys the sweets. And uh, I had one. And, of course, uh, you know, Taker had one. And Percy had one. Next morning, I go down to breakfast. And I'm sitting there eating. And Percy comes up and he goes, oh, Jake, what a horrible night. I'm like, what happened, bro? He goes, the worst thing that could ever happen to a married man. I'm like, damn, that's pretty stout. Did you catch your wife <laughs> cheating on you? No, she wasn't cheating on me. But Jake, you got to understand. There I was in that beautiful suite thinking about my lovely wife. Jake, I got in the hot tub, had candles lit, drank some champagne. Then I got out of the hot tub and I went over and I laid on that big heart-shaped bed, you know, buck-ass buck naked. <laughs> and that's, when, that's when it happened, Jake. I said, well, what happened, Percy? What happened? He says, I looked up and I saw the mirror on the ceiling. <laughs> and I thought to myself, your wife is one sick bitch if she'll fuck you. <laughs> 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 Oh my goodness. Oh, that was so fucking funny. <laughs> oh She's man. Horrible. She's demented. She's twisted. She's twisted. <laughs> oh, that's outstanding. She's for me, but she said, shoot. <clears throat> that is outstanding. Yeah. So what did you think of the two of them as a pairing? Excellent. Excellent. You know, uh not at any time. Did uh, Paul Bear exceed his protege? He always made sure Mark was the, out front and he was the focus of the attention. A lot of guys that, that manage don't do that. Sometimes they try to they wind up trying to steal the show by things they're doing on the outside of the ring. You know, jumping up and down or antagonizing some fan or or constantly reaching into the ring and grabbing somebody's leg. If you do that all the time, it's just bullshit. 
but he never did anything that it wasn't time for. He'd wait to the right moment, the exact moment. And then he would go back to his spot and stand there, which told the fans, this guy believes that the undertaker has got everything under control. There is no worry about the outcome of the match. Nobody can beat this man. That's what he's saying to you by him is being so stoic. The fans don't get that until it happens. When it happens, you don't pick up on that, but I do. I pick up on it. I know we were tag team partners for a short period of time. Sorry about the voice. I'm doing the best I can. You're doing great. <clears throat> and we were tag team partners, and Percy would never be involved. He, he always stood in the background, just out of camera view, and let us have the spotlight. You know, and uh, he handled me perfectly. You know, he, he did the right things for me out there. You know, the snake, ooh, you know, a lot of guys wouldn't have sold it. You know, but he did. Even as a tag team partner, he still did the right thing and sold the snake. You know, and uh, we rode up and down the roads together. And that's is one of the big things that's missing today. Is guys on the road together. Where you're in a car for, say, four hours. You want to stay awake, <laughs> number one. So what do you do? There's lots of things you can do, but the smart thing to do is to talk about your match. How could my match have been better? Now you've got three other guys here that are giving their opinions. And you pick things out of what they're saying. Oh, yeah, that would work there. Oh, that could make that better. So you're getting four minds instead of one. And occasionally there'd be an argument. And on occasion, some guys have got outside the car and fought over what they thought. Yeah, it happens. But not with me and Mark. We just talked, and uh, he asked a lot of good questions. And then Percy at times would, uh, Jake, what do you think about this? You know, and, and I would tell him what I thought about it. He wasn't asking for himself. He was asking for Mark. Which... Kept Mark from feeling like a Mark, <laughs> you right. know, because uh, he was such he was such a colossal gut sized guy. Anyway, you know, um, his size is legit. You know, they, they say I'm six five when I'm actually six four. They say Hogan's six eight. He's actually six five. <laughs> Undertaker six eight six nine. Yeah. Every day of the week. Yeah. Every day of the week. And uh, he always took his gimmick seriously. And I give him that because it was tremendously hard to work that gimmick. You'd think it would be easy, but it wasn't to do it right. Right. Uh, basically, you're no selling everything. You set up on everything. So how do you get things to work? Well, if you'll remember whenever we fought at WrestleMania, I did ET him twice, but I didn't cover him immediately. See, that was me taking care of the DD team. Mm -hmm. and it was also me taking care of him because there has to be some doubt of him not getting up. Sure. Everybody's waiting for that moment when he doesn't set up. You know what I'm saying? But yet he keeps coming. Now, we go to the uh, the segment that Percy and I did on the funeral parlor, where that was my idea, by the way, to, to gouge out the casket so we could slam his hand in it. That was my idea. And for him to drag the casket coming after me, that's about as spooky as it fucking gets. Yeah. <laughs> but... I don't know how many shots they showed, but I hit him 
with 15 stiff shots with that chair. Wow. But I told him I was going to. So, Mark, we got to make this right. I'm not going to hit you in the head. I'm not the honky tonk man. <laughs> you know, I'll hit you somewhere safe. So I'm hitting him. But here's Jake Roberts thinking. You, you remember the bit where, where uh, Randy was going to come through the curtain yep. with Elizabeth? And I'm going to yep. hit him with the chair. But Mark grabs the chair. Oh, my God. Now Randy takes it and whacks me. You don't have to ask Randy Savage to hit you harder. Okay? You never had to ask that. Because when he hit you, he brought it. He hit me, man. Oh, my God. Holy shit. And Mark was like, Jake, are you all right? Holy shit. Because Mark was right beside me. He, he, he felt it, even though it didn't hit him. I'm like, hey, let me see that. So we wash it out. Let's try another one, Randy. And Mark's like, are you serious? You're going to do it again? Yeah, I want to make sure it's right. No, I wasn't making sure it was right. I was setting Mark up for the bit when I hit him 15 times. He can't bitch about it now. You know? And he didn't. He did come through the curtain though and say, dude, fuck my back. And I think I gave him some title on all threes. <laughs> you're always you're looking out for him at the end of the day. There you yeah, go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I want to dive more into the character nuances in just a second here, but you caught my eye when you said that you guys were traveling together on the road and you weren't fighting, you were just talking wrestling. And you know why you were able to do that, Jake the Snake Roberts? Well, it's because, go ahead, do you have an idea why? Yeah, I do. Because we didn't have to worry about the automobile we were driving in. If it breaks down, we're covered. Hell yeah, yeah. you are. You know, you guys, you guys had car shield. Damn right. We did. <laughs> hey, just because we're wrestlers doesn't mean we're stupid. <laughs> that's, that's a stereotype. That's a bad conception of wrestlers, man. Just a stereotype. Just Wait till I tell all the other guys that you said we were stupid. Boy, that's bullshit. Well, this you know, episode, we shield, man. this episode of DDP snake pit is brought to you by car shield car shield makes makes it easy and affordable to protect your car from expensive repairs and that is just for starters it's the number one auto protection company in the u.s and offers protection plans for around about a hundred bucks a month or so the plans cover more parts than ever before whether your car is 5,000 miles or 150,000 miles as jake was saying and it is so simple to get your car fixed when you need a repair you choose the mechanic and car shields administrators handle the rest that is it you don't have to deal with the paperwork the headaches you're taken care of and the same goes if your car breaks down and you're stuck on the side of the road plans for car shield yep. coast to coast roadside assistance and administrators are there for you with rental car options trip reimbursement no extra cost so if you get your coverage today you're going to lock in your price now it's never going to go up that means as long as you own your car no matter how old it is you're protected from the rising cost of parts and repairs for your vehicle car shield helps protect my wallet from expensive car repairs they're going to do the same for you go to carshield.com slash podcast to start your plan and lock in your pricing forever that's carshield.com slash podcast a deductible may apply how, how how good of a driver or how bad of a driver was the undertaker Jake the Snake Roberts. He never drove when I was in the car. I did. Was that you know, a preference I, thing on your behalf? Yeah. Yeah. I always preferred driving. Um, I learned over the years, it'll probably save a lot of arguments because I have a certain way of driving that I like, which is fast and safe. Uh, some guys can drive fast, but they're sloppy. And um, that's the one time you don't play around is when you're driving because not only are you affecting my life you're affecting my children my grandchildren his children his children everybody there's 30 or 40 people that are directly affected now it's car shield thing <clears throat> the reason that i doubted it at first is because rick flair told me about it and i thought <laughs> it was a, i thought it was a rib you know and uh you know anytime i hear whoo i think there's a rib coming 
<laughs> but he was he was right on that one, man. He nailed it. There you go. But uh, yeah. yeah, man, traveling back in those days was it was an art because yeah. uh, you know you didn't want to stop a bunch of times and delay yourself. Um, you wanted to get to where you were going and get it done. But at the same time, you'll be more alert if you're talking about something that perks everybody's interest. You know, whether it's talking about my match or his match or, or what, what Percy's doing, it didn't matter. It was usually just the three of us. That's all one car could take. You yeah, know? I would certainly say so. Well, it was always tough with me because I had the damn snake in the trunk. Person used to get, get mad because he found out that uh, the only time I put the snake in the back seat was when he was riding with us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I want to get a little more into the presentation of The Undertaker because it's so unique. It's something so different than anything that Vince McMahon had put on television at that point. Mm -hmm. And you were talking a little bit about the difficulties in, in not selling very much for your opponents. And maybe that can cause some tension between performers. Oh, it does. It so did. how did Mark handle those challenges in working with guys who maybe weren't too fond of the whole no selling stuff? Because of the way he carried himself in the back, you know, if, if, uh, Somebody else may have gotten that character. They wouldn't have handled it the same way, and it wouldn't have lasted until the water got hot because somebody would have knocked the son of a bitch out because you know selling me, that, that hurts. That hurts. But here's what you do. If a guy's going to no-sell you, what do you do? Let me ask you. What do you do? If the guy's no selling you, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be pretty upset about the fact no, that you don't have to get upset. What do you do? I mean, you should just talk to him. No. Get in the ring. Take him off his feet. Oh, okay. He has to get back up. If I if I take you off your feet ten times and you haven't done shit to me, I'm pretty much kicking your ass. <laughs> See what I'm saying? That's why you're the wrestler. So Don't do things like when I ddt him. I waited four or five seconds before I covered him because I didn't want to hurt my finishing maneuver. So I set up a spot where I'd hit him with it, but I was still selling and I was out and he was out. But yet I came up before he did, you know, little things, man, little things, little things matter. So if you got somebody that's no selling you, put them in a wrestling hole and hold on for dear life. Then when he comes out of it, take him off his feet, grab the hold again. And that's how you that's how you get off of that. If you go out there and you clothesline him nine times and you give him four or five suplexes and he sets up, who's a pussy? Both of you are. Fair point. You for doing it, you for doing it, and him for getting up. Because you you just destroyed your credibility. As long as you don't destroy your credibility in a match, you're a winner. Do not destroy your credibility. I've told you about credibility before. Very much so. You know. I think credibility is the backbone of any pro wrestler. Absolutely. Should be. Should be. It, it's an industry where you have larger than life characters. You have guys who are meant to win and lose. So if they don't have any credibility, why are you as a viewer enticed to tune in the next week to see right. what's going to happen? But me, but me as a wrestler, my job is not to strip my credibility. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? By not doing stupid shit. Fair point. By not clotheslining him nine times. By not suplexing him four times. Try to wrestle him. Take him off his feet. When he's on his back and I'm standing over him, who's the man? I am. Simple. But yet, a lot of guys want to go out there and throw fucking punches. And he's not going to sell for you anyway, so what are you doing, stupid? <laughs> Duh. 
Really think about it, guys. Yeah. So we're we're talking about those early days around ninety one. You're working with Percy and you're working with Mark. You guys, I mean, we've talked about this on the podcast in the past, and I'm sure we'll talk about it in the future. You were setting something up for an angle with Warrior, and we know that things would ultimately not come to pass there. But you guys pivot here, and at SummerSlam 1991, it's the wedding reception of Macho Man and Miss Elizabeth. And uh, you and Taker crash the reception, but Sid makes the save. Uh, it's it's a pretty memorable segment, and I want to know, at that point in SummerSlam, did you know that you'd be working with The Undertaker down the line uh, at WrestleMania eventually? I didn't know that it would be that soon. I thought it was going to be later. I think The Undertaker and I, as a tag team, could have done a, an easy six-month run with anybody and everybody. You know what I mean? I think they missed out on that. I think we would have drawn a lot of money as a tag team. Or in Fatal Four Ways. Of course, they didn't do that back then. But, uh, yeah, I think they missed the boat on our tag matches because we were unbeatable as a tag team. How the hell are you going to beat those fucking guys? Yeah. And uh, I think the big problem with us not – the reason they didn't go with the tag thing is that we would have been so unbeatable that it would have turned him babyface too soon. See, that's what happens. If you stick to your credibility and you never waver, you'll wind up being a babyface. Yeah. It happens that way because you're not stupid and you know, you're not out there doing cheap shit, shit that doesn't matter, uh, wasted stuff. You're not out there doing that stuff. You're, you're out there grinding it, chewing it, beating it, slapping it, spanking it. And, and one, two, three, that's what your, your, your machines. And if he can't be beaten, if he can't be knocked down and to stay down, and I got the snake and the DDT, who the hell's going to beat us? Right. Oh, my God. Well, you're working Randy Savage, and as you alluded to earlier, uh, you're, you're about to do some business here on Randy and Liz, and Undertaker makes the safe. And Undertaker, yeah. Undertaker this dead man zombie character, Turns babyface. Frankenstein. And Frankenstein. And that yeah. would eventually lead to the segment you alluded to on the funeral parlor. Yeah. So we're we're going hard here with The Undertaker as a babyface into WrestleMania with you as a heel. What kind of burden, if any, did you feel in having to get this blue chipper big man who's now a babyface zombie over? What kind of challenge was that for you? Oh, that was easy. Really? Why so? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm the one that tried to hit the woman. So I'm a real dick. And the funny thing about fans is this. If you go out there and you don't destroy your credibility and you're a kick-ass son of a bitch who has no emotions, you're unbeatable. Now, as a wrestling fan... Do I want to keep breaking my own heart by hoping that somebody else is going to beat this guy when it's not going to happen? Or do I simply jump on the boat? You know, uh, wrestling fans are great about jumping on the boat. <laughs> you know, when something really good happens to a guy, everybody jumps on. You know, if you look back to the any, anybody turning baby face from being a strong heel. It's overnight, click. It's like you've set the whole thing, the bonfire is going. It's there. All we had to do was walk to the fucking ring. And all I had to do is show my frustration, try some things, show my frustration, I'm not getting it done. Then I go for the cheap stuff, try to take him out, then I get the DDT on him. I think I've got it. Holy fuck, kid, are you serious? He's up. I don't believe this shit. Desperate, desperate, desperate. Try again. He's up again. My God, what am I going to do? Roll outside the ring. Get stopped. <laughs> he plants me. And um, 
what the fans didn't know was the night before I'd had a meeting with Vince McMahon and uh, told him that I was quitting. You know, that uh, he had broken too many promises to me. He had promised me a certain position that I wanted. This was a writing position or on creative, yes. correct? Creative, yeah. Because I know how good I am at that. Without me, there's no Undertaker. Without me, there's no Steve Austin. I even helped Shawn Michaels as much as I could. You know, who do you, th- you know, Shawn, Shawn spent some time in my car. And I'm the one that came up with the, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have an urgent message. Sean has left the building, you know, which is so cheap. It's so fucking bullshit, you know. Um, but anyway, the road warriors would have never happened without me. Sure. Because they were under my tutelage for quite a while. Yeah, they would have made it eventually, but they wouldn't know what I've taught them. And uh, I enjoy teaching. I love to create new characters. Oh my God. I I had one character I wanted to do for Jim Neidhart. And the deal was going to be, he's called the mole. You know, and what happens is he refuses to come out to the ring until they turn the lights off. Because <laughs> it's much too bright. It's much too bright. I can't see. It's much too bright. Turn the lights off. I'll come out. Of course, you turn the lights off. He comes out and whacks the fucking guy. When the lights come back on, he's beating the shit out of the guy. There you go. He's the mole. I like it. So so how would that conversation with Vince go ahead of WrestleMania? Bad. (laughs) Real bad. Uh, I, I, I was real angry at the time. I I tried to show as much disrespect for him as I could at that moment Mm -hmm. because I was angry. I felt like he had betrayed me and lied to me. Um, Number one, I should have been with Randy Savage at WrestleMania. So did you have a problem working with Undertaker? No, no, not at all. But it wasn't time for it yet. Sure. We could have got me and Savage to WrestleMania, and it would have been fire as hot. Vince McMahon hot shotting booking? No way. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Well, what happened was Randy had married a young girl from the hills, mountains of Tennessee, wherever she's from. Elizabeth, her family, they were country people country people they didn't know that wrestling wasn't real mm. they believed and when I slapped Elizabeth oh boy they lost their shit oh boy uh, Randy went to go home to see the family and they wouldn't let him in the house wow they, they, you know they, they threatened they actually threatened him. Get the hell off our property. You lied to us. You said our little girl would never get hurt. And she got slapped by that no good son of a bitch, Jake Roberts. What'd that do for me? Well, every night that I got in the ring with Randy, I'm trying to save my own ass. Because he's coming at me like a wild fire, man. He's He's wanting to show his family that he's kicking my ass. Oh, it was brutal, man. So that's why they hurried up and put us together because Randy was having so many problems at home that they, they needed to finish that off. So you're having these conversations with Vince. They're not going well. I got two questions to follow up with that. A, is the WrestleMania match with The Undertaker in jeopardy? And B, was Mark Calloway aware of the dissension you were having with Vince? Yes, he was aware. But I would have never... Walked out. Okay, so the match or was Mark. not in the match was not no, in jeopardy. No, okay. no, I, I was going to do the job for Mark. Okay, because I wanted to. 
because I wanted to. And for the business. This is business. I'm not going to screw the fans by not giving them that. I'm not going to screw Mark Calloway taking 15 shots in his back with a damn steel chair. That uh, that chair took a beating, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. The chair looked worse than Mark did. <laughs> Well, you become the second victim in what we would know as the streak, the iconic <laughs> Undertaker streak at WrestleMania 8. It's a six and a half minute match. You hit Taker with the DDT twice, as you said. Taker pops up both times from it. Uh, you go chasing after Paul Bearer out, <clears throat> pardon me, Paul Bearer outside, and Taker ends up hitting you with the tombstone on the floor and rolls you back in for the win. Uh, there is a rumor that. The original finish wasn't for you to be Tombstone outside, and that was actually something that was called in the ring. Is that fact or fiction? That's true. What was it supposed to be? It was supposed to have been Tombstone in the ring. Okay. But what's, I thought what's the idea. I thought, I thought it fit well. Me chasing, Mar, uh, chasing Paul Bear, Paul Bear, mm -hmm. and then Mark getting me right there. Um. And having that done to me in, on the floor is much more dangerous than having it done in the ring. I know I took a lot of heat for that. But they still had it all on camera. So there was nothing robbed there. But, and I get the point. The point is, him doing it to you in the ring, everybody could have seen it better. And that's where I screwed up. It wasn't something where I didn't want to do the job, because I certainly I did. If I didn't want to do the job, I'd have never DDT'd him once. Right. It's also, it's WrestleMania, right? It's your biggest event of yeah. the year. So why not do something a little grandiose? A tombstone on the outside is a pretty big deal. Like, that's yeah. not a... It's, I, a, it's a kill shot. Yeah. I don't really have an issue with that, honestly. Yeah. Maybe, See, maybe, yeah, I don't know. My thought was, I'm going to take this tremendous kill shot on the floor... And never be seen again. So you knew you were done after that? Yeah, I was. Yeah. That was the deal. Yeah. He had to release me if I did the match. Okay. And Vince agreed to that? Yeah. So this is your farewell. Was it a little bittersweet for you? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. I was hurting, man. I, I began having problems at home, which magnified all this. And uh, <clears throat> the addiction was starting to rear its head. You know, it, it's really hard to be out on the road for 20, 30 days at a time, not see your wife or your children. And your relationship struggling. Uh, we didn't have cell phones. You should see some of the phone bills I racked up during that time. You know, going to a hotel and being on the phone for an hour and a half. <laughs> phone bill would be more than the room. You know? And when I hung up the phone, nothing was any better. It's still this issue, you're not home. You're not home. You're gone too much. You're gone too much. And I got it because I was hating it. But Vince was running us so hard. Oh, my God. Hell, I wrestled Steamboat 90 days straight. You know, without a day off. That's three months. Three months. Didn't see my family. It's awful. It's horrible, man. And, and you're getting beat up. Your body's hurting. Um, you got troubles at home. You know, you, you lay in bed at night and the phone's ringing at three and four in the morning because she's not sleeping. She's pissed off and she knows the only time that she can get me is when I'm in that fucking hotel room. So it's ringing all night long. How much rest am I getting? Not hmm. much at all. Not much at all. And... Yeah. uh she had every right in the world to be angry. Every right in the world. You know, she's not stupid. Um, you know, 
And you, if the phone rings, you got to pick it up. If you don't, where were you? Oh, I was there. I just didn't want to talk to you. Right, right. Let me see. So that was a tough period for you, and you needed the. It was probably the worst time of my life, yeah. man. Uh, the hardest time of my life. You know, it yeah. got it got a lot worse. Yeah, it got a lot worse. Yeah. Well. Look, uh, ultimately here, you're, you're able to step away and we know that you would come back. But before we get to that, I want to talk about one of our friends here of DDP Snake Pin. That, of course, is IWTV. IWTV.live is yeah, independent yeah. wrestling's premier streaming service for live events and video on demand of past events. If you like stars tech- of tomorrow. The stars of tomorrow and the stars of today. If you like seeing technical wrestling, you'll see the likes of Wheeler Yuta, Daniel Garcia, Jonathan Gresham. If you like the hard-hitting style, you can see Eddie Kingston. If you're a Deathmatch fan, you'll see Masato Tanaka, among many others. And if you like seeing managers go be thrown off the top rope, you can put on IWTV, Jake, and you can see me, John Alba, go off the top rope into a doomsday device. It happened just a month ago at Limitless Wrestling, and it's on IWTV. Yeah, but you're not a real manager, are you? Oh, yeah. I, I worked the Indies. I thought, I thought you were just a dick, you know? <laughs> Sometimes those things go hand in hand, and for just ten dollars a month, IWTV.live offers twenty plus events streamed live each month from top independent wrestling. And just this past week, they had ten live events. That's one dollars an event. No better value in wrestling streaming today. And as an IWTV.live subscriber, you have immediate access to the extensive library of more than thirteen thousand hours of video on demand wow. content from over three hundred independent wrestling promotions from around the world. That's crazy. Beyond Wrestling, Prestige Wrestling, Absolute Intense Wrestling, and H2O. You can watch IWTV Live anytime, anywhere on Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire TV sticks, including mobile apps for Apple and Android devices. There are no long-term contracts required. Just go to IWTV.live and subscribe today for just $10 a month. Jake, imagine if a service like this had been around when you guys were coming up through the territory. Wow. It would have been unbelievable in terms of getting your stuff yeah. out there. See, that was always the problem, man, back in the day. To establish yourself would take a, a good five years because you had to go to each place and become a star in that place. Then you go to another place, you had to work your way to the top there, then another place before you get the whole world talking about you. Now, with IGTV, they can find about, out about you right now. IWTV's they, got you covered, man. They've got yeah, you man. covered. It's fantastic. So tell me about your experience uh, managing that, that night. Yeah, so, well, I've uh, I've been working the Indies for about eight years. I work over with the Monster Factory, the world-famous Monster Factory in South Jersey. I do some coaching yeah. there. It's been so much fun, man, getting to see some of these stars of tomorrow, and that's my favorite thing about going into the IWTV archives. I got to work with Daniel Garcia when he was 19 years old, before he was on wow. AWTV. And, and there are so many guys like and, and girls like that who I've been so fortunate to work with, especially in the New England scene. And IWTV has literally 13,000 hours of tape of people like that. So that's, uh, a real, that's a real hotbed up there, man. New England right now is a very big hotbed. Very hot. And it's it's yeah. a great territory. There's Wheeler Yuta was in there a lot. Uh, so many great talent that Tony Khan really has his finger on the pulse for came from that scene so sure of uh, course re- really cool stuff there go check it out guys iwtv dot live uh so jake when you go back to wwf in 1996 there's been a bit of a change with the undertaker he is straight shooting and he is the locker room leader even at a yeah. pretty young age he's the locker room leader what was your yeah. perception of him once you came back oh i couldn't have been more happy couldn't have been more happy you know at the time you know, I'd gotten clean and sober, and uh, he came back. To, I wasn't supposed to be wrestling, but it wound up somebody got hurt, so I had to come out of the office and go on the road. Such bullshit that was. <laughs> I was the only guy that could replace him. Fuck you. You know, they just wanted to get two things for one pay- one paycheck, you know? That's right. I couldn't believe that. I, I, I was still doing the writing, and I'm on the road, but I got one check just for the writing. I didn't get paid for being on the road. And you didn't even make yourself world champion. You should have done that right. while you are at it. <laughs> well, no, I'm not that stupid. But uh, it was really hard, man. And uh, we went to Europe. And uh, 
traveling on a bus and it was brutal, man. Yeah. And there were a few guys that hung out in the back that decided, you know what? Fuck him. He's an old man. Let's fuck with Jake. So they started putting beer in my fucking suitcase, Oof. a few joints, a piece of hash, you know, and then I'd be in the locker room, go to open my bag, and here's all this shit. Everybody's like, oh, look at that. Jake's fucking doing drugs. Jake's fucking, oh, yeah, he's fucking drinking. And it had gotten pretty rough. And uh, it was this close to being a fight, which I but probably got my ass. When you have uh, guys like The Undertaker back there, though, does that help mediate the situation a little bit? Well, what happened was Undertaker was sleeping on the trips underneath the bus. Oh, <laughs> He had his own... <laughs> He had his own private compartment. Get a little cot underneath there. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, it was like called luggage, but he <laughs> would get under there and make himself a pallet and sleep. That's unbelievable. We pulled over to piss and Undertaker came out, came into the bus and brought everybody to their attention and said, guys, quit fucking with Jake. If wow. he goes, if he goes back to drinking, He'll kill every fucking one of you guys. Trust me. I know. Don't get Jake to drink him. And that was the end of it. How meaningful was that for you that a guy that you helped mentor had your back later on a few years down the line? It's, it's what was right. He did what was right. You know, and I respect that in so many different ways. I had so much love for Mark. You know, and, uh, <clears throat> so so <clears throat> so fortunate to be there for him. Yeah, and then he came back and was there for me. You know, it, that's what happened in those days. You know, and you develop those relationships with guys when you're on the road with them, driving up and down the highways, talking about you yourself and your family, and you could be, become really tight. And then when something comes up, everybody knows the right thing to do. We have a few questions from our ad-free shows fans that I want to get to, but before we do, I have one question for you. Yeah. You're inducted to the Hall of Fame in 2014 in New Orleans. The next night, the streak ends. It's yeah. this insane moment that will live on in wrestling history. It was one of the most yeah. shocking things that I've ever seen in person. Yeah. Did they make Should the have... right did they make the right no. decision? No, they did not. No, they did not. Why, Why not? waste it? Because it wasn't needed. Lesnar was already a monster, right? He was a badass. He was a monster. He didn't need that push. If he had done it with somebody that wasn't at that level, then I'd said, okay, yeah, that'd be good. Because you're bringing somebody up. But to do it with a guy that's equal to you, or that's what their thinking was, but Mark was still here as far as I'm concerned, you know, then it would have meant something. But to do it with a guy that's equal with you, you haven't accomplished anything. But waste the opportunity to get somebody over. You know, if, if Mark was going to do that, the, the only person I can think of doing it with would have been uh oh my god my brain just went i mean there were a few guys that certainly were in that discussion cm punk was super hot at the time and he faced him the year prior no. uh no man uh at the, the time champ now. Oh, the champ now. well there were all the well roman reigns roman reigns if roman reigns sure roman Rain, mm -hmm. yeah that would have been something but you to get, to get the most out of that, you got to bring somebody that's down here, up here. Sure. That's when you get a sustainable pop. You know what they got out of that? The way they did it? Disgust. People were disgusted with that. I've talked to the fans. They fucking hated it. Yeah. Do you think it elevated Brock to another level, though? No. No, nope, not at all. And he's already destroyed it anyway. 
You know, now that, he's a baby, now that he's a baby face, he's flopping around for everybody. That's fair. Am I right? That's fair. Thank right, you. Let, let's get some questions here before we wrap up. Uh, top guy Brad Stan asked, Jake, what was your favorite version of The Undertaker? So we saw, you know, the dead man that came in in the early 90s. We saw the American Badass. We saw the Ministry. Do you have a favorite version of him? I'm, I'm old school. I like yeah. the first one. I know I was on a meeting in a meeting with with Undertaker and Vince and creative and they were talking about changing his character and I said excuse me I got one question what's that is it is it not working anymore if it's not broke don't fix it leave it the fuck alone yeah why break something that's working I thought they lost a lot when they went to the next step. I thought they lost a lot. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, Lindsay asks, have you ever ribbed The Undertaker? I'd love to hear a fun story, even a story about his fear of cucumbers. Have you ever seen his fear of cucumbers in person? I don't want to talk about that. Okay. All right. (laughs) (laughs) Are there any ribs you can share? Okay. We'll end on this. This will be our last note. Right. Let's hear it. Uh, Mark and I, we had finished the show in Houston, and we were really tired. And we just wanted to go someplace where we could listen to music and drink, drink a couple of beers, you know, chill out. So we stopped at this gentleman's bar. Well, come to find out there weren't many gentlemen in there. There was a whole bunch of young guys that were whistling and screaming at girls that were naked. It was a strip joint. And uh, we went in there anyway, and we found our little corner. But as soon as we came in, the best-looking girl in the place starts ragging on both of us. Oh, looky here. It's the phony wrestlers. Yo, guys are shit. Y'all ain't nothing. You're not fighters. You're not wrestlers. You're you're just you're just doing a stupid act. Wrestling fans are stupid, and just kept going on us and on us and on us. So we sat down, and she's still on stage doing this shit. She quit dancing. But then somebody told her, "I'm Jake the Snake Roberts." She goes, "Oh my God, you're the absolute worst. You and that phony snake." Phony snake, what the hell are you talking about, bitch? I know that snake's not real. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you had it with you, I'd get on stage and show everybody it's not real. I'd dance with it. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, before I could say anything, Mark said, go get that motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't disappoint him. <laughs> So I went to the car and I got it, and it was that King Cobra. Oh dear, the one that Savage. So I brought it in in the bag and just set it on the table. This bimbo walks over, jerks it out of the bag. I'm like, "Holy shit, she's gonna get bit right now!" And she gets up on stage and she say, "I told you, folks, it's not real." It's bullshit. He's got some delivery vice over there. He turns and makes it move and stuff. Look at this stupid bastard. And she's doing this. So she starts dancing. She's going around the pole. The third time the snake struck. (laughs) Perfect. Got the whole nipple in his mouth. And he's biting. (laughs) She's screaming. But she's still running around the pole. (laughs) She lets go of the snake. It's holding on by her nipple. And now she's like, help me, help me, help me. She's screaming her ass off. And that's where I'll end the story. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Wow. Uh, Well, I was not expecting that one. But uh, that's, hey, it's cool hearing some of your stories about Taker. And uh, clearly a, a legendary figure in his own right who transcended That's... multiple generations you guys still talk uh just i see him at an event yeah 
Yeah. Well, uh, I appreciate you sharing your stories there. And uh, this has been a fun episode of DDP Snake Pit, just with Jake the Snake Roberts. Uh, Jake, anything you want to put out there? I know people can check you out on Cameo. Uh, any yeah. Anything else you'd like to add? Well, I'm telling you right now, December, January, February, I'm going back out to do my comedy tour. There you go. So if you have a comedy club in your area that you support, go tell them to get a hold of Jake because I'm booking the tour right now. All right. And I believe we're going to hit Boston first and just go from there. I love it. I'm going, I'm going old school. I'm going to get in the car with one guy. and We're going to drive. We're going to see a little bit of the countryside and do show after show after show. And uh, this will really be my goodbye tour. Because I, I think after this one, I'm, I'm done going on the road. All right. So this is time. It's time. And hopefully by the time we start the tour, the book may be finished. I love it. I love it. I think that's awesome. That's all, I got. That's all he's got. This has been DDP Snake Pit. We'll see you next week.